and welcome to Tabletop Tea Time. In this show, I'm joined by a variety of creators to talk about a topic, some go in depth on that topic, some, well, they skip it and talk about whatever they want to, because it's a variety show of sorts. Well, let's dive in to see what some people have been thinking about crowdfunding. Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. and for Tabletop Tea Time segment on crowdfunding, it's an open-ended topic. It's such an open-ended topic. There's so many different things you can do and talk about. So uh, let's go a little general with this. Crowdfunding is such a blessing to the tabletop space in so many ways. But it's also a bad thing as much as it is a good thing, both for the industry as well as on a personal level. It represents the ability for people to bring their projects to life without being beholden to the normal restrictions that would normally be in place. So as a creator, you can do things that you otherwise wouldn't. You can have your project exist when it otherwise wouldn't. You can experiment with the types of things that would never survive in retail, the types of price points or projects that would never survive in retail. Retail is often restricted to a lot of, well, restrictions. That's things in place uh, preventing the types of things you can do on crowdfunding, both in terms of the traditional model, uh, having access, being a startup creator who just wants to bring something to life, but also the nature of having, you know, uh, you know the manufacturer, you have the publisher, you have the, the distributor, you have the seller, you have all these different chains, which means generally in retail, if you spend $20 making your product, it has to cost around $100 by the time you get to the end of it, which really limits the types of ambitious projects you see in crowdfunding. Crowdfunding opens those doors. It allows people to create things that never otherwise would be able to exist. Things with lower margins because you've cut out two people in the middle, the retailer and the distributor. And things that are more ambitious that test the waters because even though it's expensive to fail on crowdfunding no matter what, at least it's less expensive because you haven't actually made the stuff and then found out there's no demand for it. It allows creators to be more innovative. It allows creators to find an audience. And as a result, it has become an incredible boon for the tabletop space and the things we see in board gaming. It also has downsides. It has FOMO baked into it left, right, and center. It has the promise of lower price points that don't actually end up being lower price points. It has the idea that you're saving money when you often aren't saving money. It has the idea of these exclusives and all these things that make the game better, but if they make the game better, why aren't they in the final game that goes to retail? There's such a kind of twisted dynamic, a, a misaligned incentive structure. If you want people to give you money for your game before it ever exists, a year and a half before it shows up on shelves, a year and a half before they can watch a ton of reviews, there has to be some incentive you give, which means you're kind of creating almost an at odds incentive structure where the creator's desire to make the project involves twisting and deforming what they would ideally make in order to bring people in the door when they need the money to create it. It means you get stretch goals and exclusives that may or may not add value. If they do add value, it means the final product's not as good. If they don't add value, it means you're basically paying for tchotchkes just for the sake of feeling you got value out of it. It means sometimes you buy things or pay for things and it shows up at your friendly local game store before you ever get your own copy and sometimes doing so while you know possibly getting it at a cheaper price point as well. So there's really no incentive and you walk away from the experience, experience feeling a bit betrayed by this potential collaboration where you're bringing something to life but you feel taken advantage of instead. I think crowdfunding is genuinely a blessing and a curse. I think it is amazing for creators, but it sets a degree of obligation on them that is all in, all powerful and encompasses everything. The idea of having to talk to your investors every day to release updates when things aren't going well. There's suddenly this pressure that it, it, it seems so promising at first. It seems like such a good opportunity, but suddenly there's obligations and responsibilities to create, to deliver that $30,000 funding goal that seemed like such a good idea once upon a time hasn't even come close to being able to finalize your project, let alone pay you for your time. I think crowdfunding works best when both the creators and the backers know what they're getting into. When the creator understands the risks, the dangers, how it actually works, the actual obligations, the idea of not just bringing a project to your life, but ensuring that it doesn't become a mental drain on you for the next year and a half or possibly longer. I think it works best from the backer when they understand what they signed up for. They understand a realistic assessment of what they're getting out of backing it early, when those things are going to show up. And if they don't show up, that it shouldn't ruin their day. It shouldn't ruin the project. Maybe you change your mind about what you back in the future. That's always okay, but don't get too invested into it as a backer. Don't get too stuck on what you need to get out of it. Experiment with it. 
back because you have whatever your reasons are back whatever those reasons are the reasons might be you wanted that exclusive it might be you thought you're getting a cheaper price point it might be you thought you were getting it early but in all cases don't get too attached to those reasons look at it as an experiment you backed it because you wanted it early and if it doesn't show up early and you could have gotten it retail Take that into your mental mind map for the future. Hold on to it for the next time. The next time you're looking at a project and debating with the FOMO of I want it, I want it, but do I need it? Maybe you could get it later. Let all your experiences within crowdfunding, the good ones and the bad ones, let them guide how you act in the future, but don't let them turn you into a bitter person in the present. Crowdfunding is full of so much good opportunity, so many ex great experiences and great games. But the nature of it means that we're also setting ourselves up for frustration if we let ourselves get too emotionally invested in the things that don't matter the things that do matter are the games that's why we're here we play this hobby so we can spend time around a table enjoying something either with our friends or by ourselves but so we can have fun that's why we're here we're here to have fun we're here to connect and if we let an experience with a board game or crowdfunding in any way shape or form if we let those experiences make it so that we don't have fun or so we lose the opportunity to connect so that we treat others not as people, but as things to yell at, then to a certain extent, we've lost sight of why we're backing those games in the first place. Hey everybody, I'm Evan, and today I'm gonna show you a game that you have probably never heard of. So today we're talking about crowdfunding, and I've been backing games on Kickstarter for about 10 years at this point. So to find a game that would fit this series, I went through my history of backed projects and I found the least funded game. And that just so happened to be a trick-taking game from last year that only had 53 backers and it barely funded. But like like this much and it, it wouldn't have funded so um yeah that game is called guilty food tricks in fact it's called hashtag guilty food tricks all one word have you heard of this one let's go down to the table and i'll show you how it works guilty food tricks is a trick-taking game for three or four players it was designed by someone named noon spelled n-u-u-n and is published by a company called Ah, uh, games or AAAA -A 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 games. Either way, it's six A's and then games in their title. Um, so in this game, you are dealt a hand of six cards and one of these cards. Whoever is dealt the purple four is the leader of the first trick for that round. And then you play through uh, seven hands or seven tricks uh, per round and then three rounds and then you total up your score at the end and the person with the most wins. So, if someone plays the purple four, like a trick-taking game, you have to follow suit, and then the winner would be the person with the highest uh, number in that suit. If you play an off-suit card, you cannot win the trick. So the, tr the, the idea is uh, low-numbered cards have positive points, which are these circles here. High-numbered cards have negative points, which are these X's here. So you want to win the tricks with as low a number as possible. Uh, otherwise, you're going to end up in the negative points, which, as you can see here on the scoreboard, goes down to negative 12. And I think I've actually uh, finished a game in negative 13 at this point. At that point. Um, so uh, negative points are entirely possible in this game. However, if you go through an entire, uh, round, uh, entire round not winning a trick, you get one of these tokens, which are worth five positive points at the end of the game. Um, so I, th I think what really stands this game apart is the art, because the, the art of this food on these cards is, is almost unbelievable. Um, like, it looks so good. Like, you want to eat whatever you're seeing here in these pictures, because it's, it's amazing. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention is you also get one of these cards in your hand. And when you play this one, you get to choose a card from this display. So if strategically there's a time you want to play one of the cards that are face up, then you have to play that one. But remember that you, everyone does have to play all of their cards. So at some point, you're going to have to grab one of these cards. So sometimes the sooner the better. That way you get a better pick of which card you might want to play. Um, yeah, and that pretty much wraps it up. 
I think that about covers it. Um, the blacks, I want to mention that the black suit is only used for the four-player game. You, you take these cards out if you're using a three-player game. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. So let's go back up on top and we'll talk about it a little bit more. So there you have it. That's hashtag guilty food tricks. Uh, a pretty standard trick taking game, but I think it's actually pretty fun. Um, so the story behind this game is one of the the designing team owns a cafe and and they got really popular on TikTok. So popular, uh, in fact, that people would come in, order the food, take pictures of it, not eat it, and then leave. So um, the 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 designer had the idea of like. Uh, like the negative impact of social media. So that's kind of like the theme of this game because like it's gorgeous food, but people weren't eating it. They were just taking pictures of it to get, you know, f famous on social media or whatever. Um, yeah, so somehow that's the theme of a trick-taking game. Um, if you're looking for a copy of this, there, I believe, is one for sale on the Board Game Geek Marketplace. Otherwise, it is for sale on the publisher's website, but I'm not sure if you're able to order it outside of Japan. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, I was I was lucky enough to be one of the 53 backers of this on Kickstarter. And funny enough, they actually sent me four copies, so I gave a couple away. Um, I gave one to Suzanne from uh, the Salt and Sass podcast, who formerly the Dice Tower, so she's got a copy too. And then two other random people that like won a contest on my YouTube channel. Speaking of my YouTube channel, are you a subscriber? Maybe you should go check it out. Sometimes I give away interesting games. Anyway, that's this week's pick. Um, I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope everyone enjoys their tea time and I will see you next time. I have certainly backed one or two projects in my time. Before this, I just checked on Kickstarter and on there alone, and to be fair, that's where most of my backing has gone on, I've backed over a hundred different campaigns, though some were for some music, some were for uh, some video games, but predominantly, certainly in the last few years, well, it's been pretty much only board games. Now, these have ranged from small little button-shy-like games where it's, you know, maybe £10, $10 a pop for a small wallet game, through to a game which isn't even on the shelf yet, like Foundations of Rome, which, well, let's put it this way, cost a little bit more than £10. Now, one thing that I really like about a crowdfunding campaign is when they do really nice good regular updates. In fact some recent Kickstarters and crowdfunding campaigns I've kind of come away from the experience with well it was a bit of a lacklustre Kickstarter almost. Not necessarily because the the game wasn't looking amazing, I've still backed it, I'm still excited for it, but well the campaign lasted for like three weeks and there was only three updates. I love it when they do updates, even if it's with a designer interview or just going into depth about a certain mechanic from the designer's point of view or just highlighting components. Yeah, Simon do it in every day. There's basically an update which says, oh, you know, go and look at this mini or this stretch goal. It doesn't need to always be pushing new content for you to get. But I like it when it is like, oh, you know, let's zoom in on this component so you can see what you're getting. And it keeps you really engaged throughout the whole crowdfunding campaign. One interesting thing was that last year I actually made a prediction that said, well, GameFound's going to be bigger than Kickstarter for board games. And it wasn't last year, but with Simon moving over, I think we're going to see a shift in crowdfunding soon. We'll see if, you know, many other big names and just even the smaller ones follow Simon over to GameFound. I think that'll be very interesting to see what happens there in that space in the next couple of years. Anyway, that's enough of me waffling on. On with some more creators. Hi, I'm Josh from the YouTube channel Josh Yaks, and when Kickstarter showed up, I thought, wow, that's cool. What a great way for a creative person to be able to get their item into the market or for a company to be able to offer a super deluxe version of one of their games to people that are willing to pay for it. And so on November 17th, 2011, I pledged my first two Kickstarter games. I pledged for Kings of Air and Steam, which I still have on my shelf here, and Empires of the Void by Red Raven Games. 
And then over the course of the next seven years, I pledged for a total of 19 games, seven expansions, and four board game accessories, as well as two books and three wallets. Of those 19 games that I purchased through crowdfunding, I still own three of them. The other 16 I have sold off. The three I still own, like I said, are Kings of Air and Steam, as well as Gloomhaven, which my records show that I paid $79 for, and that must be in American funds, because normally I keep track in Canadian currency, but either way, it was a steal at $79. And then the third one I still have is Hardback, which is an awesome deck-building word game. Along the way, there was also two particular disappointments, games that didn't reach their funding goals and thus didn't get produced. One was a party game called But Wait, There's Even More, and then the other, the one that was the biggest disappointment for me was supposed to be an expansion for Kings of Air and Steam called Kings of Air and Steam World's Fair. I've played this game so much and enjoy it so much that I was getting to a point where I really needed that expansion to freshen up the game for me, but unfortunately it never came to be. But then in November 7th, 2018, I made my last crowdfunding pledge and the combination of my own financial situation, which was exacerbated by the fact that my Canadian dollar conversion was also getting worse and shipping costs were going ever higher, which meant that no matter how cheap I could get it through crowdfunding, it was always cheaper to wait for it to appear on store shelves. And I was just no longer in a financial situation to be able to loan a board game company money and then wait a year, two years, maybe even three years to get the game. So five years ago, I stepped away from crowdfunding and it was only this last year in July of 2023 that I got back to GameFound and I pledged for Planet Unknown Supermoon because I had previously purchased Planet Unknown and was really regretting the, the fact that I didn't have the Kickstarter exclusive Planets Incorporations because it ended up being a game that I played a ton and kind of played through everything that was in the game. And then just the other day on March 14th, 2023, I pledged once again, this time for Thunder Road Vendetta Maximum Chrome. Last Christmas, I was looking for Thunder Road Vendetta to pick up for my boys as a fun game to play with them, but it was sold out everywhere. So when it showed up again on crowdfunding, I decided to pledge for it in the hopes that next Christmas we'll have it for the boys. I have no real intention though to get back to crowdfunding despite these two items that I have pledged for over the past two years. It was fun while it lasted, but I'm quite happy to wait for games to show up in retail and see if I still want to spend the money on them when they do. Catch you next time. Cheers. Hi, I'm Barb Mabel, PhD, and I'm an astronomer and a gamer, which means I see the universe in everything that I do, including board games. In this segment, I am taking a look at astronomy that I'm finding in non-astronomy themed board games. Today I'm looking at Bunny Kingdom, and in particular, Bunny Kingdom with its expansion, In the Sky. Bunny Kingdom at its heart is a drafting game where you are drafting cards that will allow you to build out your own Bunny Kingdom on this board. As you draft cards, often they will be coordinates on the board where you can place one of your bunnies. Some of those places will have cities, some will have crops, other things will have nothing, but you can build those up later with other cards that you draft that have different kinds of crops, exotic materials you might be able to get out of the ground, cities that will help you score. So you will score after each round of drafting. And the scores that you will get are from each of your different regions of the bunnies. Uh, you will score the number of turrets, which come from the different cities in the region, multiplied by the different resources that you make in that region. The expansion adds another board that gives you additional places to place your bunnies and a lot of new exotic resources. And it was one of those regions on the cloud board that uh, got my attention as an astronomer. It is a space that features shooting stars. Now, as many of you may know, shooting stars aren't stars at all, but they are little pieces of debris called meteors. And what's happening is that a tiny piece will hit the atmosphere. As it's plunging through the atmosphere, it will push material in front of it and superheat it. And since it's traveling when it hits the atmosphere, it's going to appear to us to arc across the sky. Most of them are only about a millimeter in size. And on any given night, you might see about six of them per hour if you're in a place with really dark skies. Those come from asteroids. They're little bits of asteroids that have collided and left a mess behind them. And there's enough of those little pieces that as we're going in our orbit, Earth is running into a bunch of them and creating all of these meteor shower, meteors that we can see. 
Now there's another type of meteor shower. These are nights during the year where you can see a whole bunch of them. You might see dozens per hour. This happens when the Earth is passing through the debris cloud of a comet. And so it's predictable. We know when we're going to go through them and you can kind of plan ahead and maybe get yourself out to a place with dark skies and try and see as many of those as you can. So the next time you are playing Bunny Kingdom and you see that shooting star card come through, I would consider adding it to your bunny empire because shooting stars are really kind of awesome. So I hope you enjoyed this foray into some unexpected astronomy. Uh, if you do enjoy this kind of content, go check out my channel. Uh, it's Meeple PhD. I also am on Instagram and Blue Sky as Meeple PhD. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your tea time and I will see you next time. Okay, it's now time for the Spotlight Creator segment where every month I'll choose a creator, get them on, talk a little bit more about them, sort of an interviewee sort of thing. Well, let's dive into it and see who we've got this month. Hi, I'm Julian and this is Libby and we are from Box Meebles. Well, Ollie, I think you've got some questions for us. I certainly do have some rapid fire questions. So let's start off with, please introduce yourselves, tell us about yourself and about the channel. Um, yeah, I'm Libby, this is Julian, and uh, the channel is Box Meeples. Obviously we talk all about board games. Uh, we tend to do two to three videos a week. We do things like Favourite Game Friday, where we pick a topic and talk about a game. Um, we are trying to do one top ten list every month mm -hmm. this year. Um, we have done many of those previously, but we're trying to do one a month this year, so um, that's quite exciting. Um, we do things like Kickstarter games and tell people a little bit about yeah. those, and just general, um, if we're at conventions and things, we do vlogs, especially UK Games Expo, Essen, we've got the Aircon vlogs. Mm -hmm. March, I think I think that's so. how a lot of people discovered us was mm -hmm. from those because we try to film them and then get them up immediately as quickly as possible so people can see that as they get excited about coming to yes. the expo. Yeah. So I think a lot yeah. of people know us for that. Um, but yeah, yeah, we've been doing it for three years now. I'm actually very honoured to say I feature in one of those convention vlogs, but I won't tell you which, you'll go and have to watch them to find that out. Now, what is your favourite game and mechanism? So like many channels, we've recently done our top 50. We have. And spoiler warning, the top of the list for me was <laughs> Root. I absolutely adore the game Root. I've played it over 150 times, uh, both on the app, which is a great way of learning how to play it, mm. and in person. Can't yeah. beat it in person. Much, much better in person. And I, I have a group of friends who also love Root almost as much as me, and we regularly play. And it's nice playing it with people who know it really well. Although that being said, although that is kind of a... A territory control game. My favourite mechanism is actually worker placement. I love, yeah, finding the ideal spot on the board to go, which has got residual benefits. And I prefer worker placement when it's tied in with another mechanism, like you see in Dune Imperium or in Lothman's Runic. Yeah, I think we're both sort of quite Euro-y at heart, but we sort of don't tie ourselves to one sort of style of gaming. So we like to make sure that we try loads of different mechanisms. And I think there's some games in almost every kind of grouping that we enjoy. Um, just some, I would say that we gravitate towards Euro that little yeah. bit more. Um, uh, my favourite game is Yado, so you've got that sort of mission completement um, where you're going out to different places to get the things that you want and completing um, all of that different task that you've got to do and it can be really tricky to get that done. Um, it's a really nice puzzle that and I love the artwork of that one. Um, yes, definitely uh, a long time favourite from the original version and then we have the master set here which I adore. A fun one for both of you. What game has the best meeple in it? Oh gosh, for me, the best meeples in a game, there's so many. I mean, there's so many great dinosaur ones, mm -hmm. um, even things like Dwellings of Eldervale and things like, oh, the dinosaur world. There's, oh, there's so many, there's so many. But I think one of the meeples I absolutely adore, I think it looks fantastic, is that great spirit that big stag that's in Botoku that is incredible he looks gorgeous I really love the meeples in World Serengeti uh, you get a load of those animal meeples in there they all look fantastic when you're playing the game and we managed to pick up extra ones because we've got the Kickstarter so our box is brimming with these animal yeah. meeples and I think they look fantastic it 
and it's got such a wonderful table presence when you're playing that game and they're moving around as you try to complete your objectives. Yeah, look into Wild Serengeti because not enough people talk about that one. Yeah, no, they are, they are fantastic. The Batoku one is really cool and amazingly unique, isn't it? But what game did you play last? Just for filming, we actually tabled Sky Team, uh, which is an incredibly tense two-player game when you're trying to land a plane. Uh, it's quite quick to play, so often we're just sitting on the sofa, we're, we have a little, little kind of like a mat, uh, like a tray, we play it on there, so we can play smaller games on the just while sitting on the sofa, and you can get that done in 20 minutes. Oh yeah, easily, so we, yeah. We can... as long as you don't spend too long thinking about how you're going to crash the plane, which is seeming inevitable. It's more than likely <laughs> going to crash the plane when we play. Don't ever get on a plane if we're piloting it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm a great pilot. You're just not a great co-pilot, right? I don't. It seems I don't have the ability to read your mind. And the one thing, the one kind of house rule that we have uh, is that when playing it, you can't talk. That's forbidden. But there's nothing stopping you going. Yeah. Because that's what a co-pilot probably would do as they yeah. decide that. Yeah, we're, we're just going full pelt now, straight yeah. into another plane. That's your face when you've rolled four sixes. Mm. Yeah, which normally in most games would be great. In this game, not so good. Super tricky. Yeah. <laughs> I so need to try Sky Team, and I will at some point. Everyone raves about it. What other hobbies do you have? So in terms of other hobbies, uh, I mean, all sorts of things, really. I mean, we both enjoy cooking. We love the cinema, the theatre. I love sailing and diving, any excuse to get abroad. I mean, <laughs> um, you've done such a lot of video gaming yep. in the past. You used to sort of write about video games, things like that as well. Um, so, yeah, all sorts of things, really. What can people expect to see coming soon on the Boxed Meeples channel? I think our channel's kind of really found what we're good at, what, what works well. So I think going forward, we're just going to do pretty much as we are doing. We try to do, a, as Libby said, a top 10 every week. We do favourite game Fridays every second Friday, really. Um, and we do our monthly game of the month. And then yeah, mm -hmm. more convention coverage, um, as and when. We're not going to the UK Games Expo this year, so there won't be any coverage on that. But leading up to it, there'll be what we're looking forward to that. Oh, for sure. We're, you know, we'll definitely be keeping our eye on all those new releases and things, and we'll have some things to say about what we're super excited about, that sort of thing. But yeah, it's, I feel we've kind of got our, our established what we do well. And I think we're very fortunate that our subscriber count's been going up and we're getting really great feedback on that. So I think, yeah, it's generally yeah. keeping that, yeah. that going. Um, we might dip into the odd playthrough occasionally. Mm -hmm. We have done one or two in the past. Um, that might be something that we do a few more times, especially with the sort of shorter games like you were discussing Sky Team mm -hmm. earlier. Um, that you know, would lend itself to something like that. So who knows what you might see. Let's keep that subscriber count going up by going to check out the Box Meeples channel. Definitely go and do it. And very much a thank you for being on today's show. It's been an absolute pleasure joining you, Ollie, and I hope you've enjoyed the answers. Yeah, absolutely. See you next time. I've certainly enjoyed the answers and I hope everyone out there watching has as well. And that about wraps us up today. Thank you very much for watching, not only checking out the Box Meeples, but all of the creators that were on today's show, their link is gonna be in the description box down below. So go check them out, share the love. That's what this is all about. And until next time, well, I hope you've enjoyed your tabletop tea.